And the teacher was one of these nice psychologists that kept saying, uh, Emily, that's not what we do here. That's not appropriate behavior. Uh, finally, after Emily had, had pulled somebody's hair and the teacher turned to them and heard that, Emily, that's, you know that's not appropriate. My daughter said, teacher, why don't you tell her she's wicked? <laughs> Want to meet Emily? Look in the mirror. <laughs> Do you really think it would be great to meet God right now, tonight, in two minutes, without any hiding, without any excuses? Wouldn't that be great? If you say yes, then you're either a very great saint or a very great fool. So our only hope is not merely that God exists, and not even merely that we can meet him, but that there's some sort of mediation, some sort of way, some sort of path. But that can happen only if, astonishingly, and there's absolutely no proof of this, God cares about us. Imagine you have an ant farm, and the ants rebel against you. Uh, wouldn't you have to be a little crazy to become an ant and go down into that ant farm and die for those ants in order to save them? Well, the difference between us and an ant is not as great as the difference between us and God. And at the heart of Christianity is the claim that this is the kind of God we've got, a God who is so crazy in love with us that that's what he did. Uh, that's our only hope, that the author entered his own story and became one of us. So instead of God just sitting around wondering whether we're going to prove his existence, he takes the initiative and he's not out there somewhere wondering whether you're going to get to him. He's the very thing that's inspiring you right now at the center of your heart to move towards him. I love Augustine's definition of God. God, he says, is that which is infinitely closer to ourselves than we can ever be to ourselves. I hope I've given you some provocative things to ask questions about. I am always amazed at how patient audiences are to sit through boring lectures, lectures are always boring, in order to get to the interesting question and answer sessions. Your purgatory is over, enter heaven, questions please. My question is the following, accepting the whole of the Christian revelation and looking at the writings within the Christian tradition, one of the, perhaps the most disturbing thesis that I've ever seen offered is that of the fewness of the saved. The notion that... That's an easy one to explain. Okay, good, because... Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus is not... When he, when he says few are saved and many are not, he's not speaking it as, as a statistician. He's speaking as a father. If I had 12 kids and one of them uh, died, that would be one too many, and 11 is, is 11 too few. One too few. Good. <laughs> we have no idea what the comparative population statistics of heaven and hell are. We have no idea. Period. Professor, I went to Boston College, but I'm too old to have had you as a teacher. <laughs> Uh, what are some of the profound things you've learned from your students? Wait a minute. This is a metaphysical impossibility. You're younger than I am, and yet you're too old to have had me as a, as a teacher. <laughs> but, all right. What are the things I've learned from my students? How stupid I am. Uh, how teachers are like farmers. They throw seeds out onto the soil and this little seed over here suddenly grows up as a plant years later. Good grief, I never even knew I said that. How frightful a responsibility is to be a teacher. I guess everybody's got their least favorite book, uh, verse in the Bible. My least favorite verse is the one, I think it's in James' epistles. He says to a congregation, uh, Brethren, uh, do not many of you want to be teachers because teachers will be judged more strictly. It seems that we've, uh, in some of your arguments, are discounting or disclaiming the fact of Jesus' divinity. Why? Well, it's, I'm just saying, what about the argument of experience? David, Solomon, and William James's variety of religious experience, I'm sure many of us here have had close encounters with God. What, what about that experience or perception? I, I, I don't quite understand the question. 
the argument of perception or experience of, of God being here with us? I think that's a very probable argument. If people who are wise and trustable in other ways claim to have had experiences of God, we ought to at least listen to them and follow them. Definitely. And even if you don't believe Jesus was divine, you've got to believe that he's a fool to be an atheist. Because there's nobody who made God more central to his whole life. Um, I actually think there are some very interesting objections to each of your... Uh points, right. but I'm not going to get into them uh, since we don't have much time. Take one. But, well, actually, I have a, a more overarching question that, that I'd like to ask. Um, and my question is that um, one, I suppose one of the easiest responses to why the existence of God is not cl clear to everyone, you know, why we would even have this conversation tonight, uh, is, you know, people's hearts are clouded by sin. They do not truly seek uh, and so forth. Um, at least in my own experience and many people I've known, I'm not convinced by that. I think that there are people who uh, are truly seeking, that are truly open, um, but do not find God to be clearly present at all. Um, so my question would be, why would God hide himself, so to speak? And um, why not make himself more clear and more specifically why faith as the big leap as opposed to love why not say here i am now choose to love me as opposed to first decide whether i'm there, whether i'm there or not that's an excellent question c.s lewis wrote a whole book his best book i think in answer to that question it's a fictional novel called till we have faces i won't even begin to summarize it it's a brilliant story your question is Bertrand Russell's question. On his deathbed, a preacher came to Russell and said, Bertie, you're going to die in a few days. You're a lifelong atheist. Suppose you find out that there is a God. What would you say to him? And Russell said, well, I suppose I should have to say that the sir, evidently, uh, you should call him sir, mark of respect and all of that. Sir, evidently you do exist, and my hypothesis of atheism was erroneous. Would you mind answering me one wee little question? Why didn't you give us more evidence? That's, that's the philosopher's question. I used to think that was a very good question. Uh, and like you, I used to think that many people are searching for God but can't find him. And the explanation that sin has darkened the human heart was just too, too dark. Uh, when I was a Calvinist, I thought Calvinism was too dark. Now I think I have more of respect for Calvinism than I ever did as a, as a Calvinist. Because I think as we get older, we know our own hearts a little better. And I think there's a lot of truth in that answer. Uh, in fact, I think that the reason God gives us so little light is that he sees that we need a lot of heart exercise. We need a lot of running after him. He plays hide and seek with us. He whispers in the ear and then runs away. Why? So that we run and run and run, and then when we finally find him, uh, we find ourselves too, because we've developed the muscles. In other words, what he wants is lovers. He doesn't just want accurate philosophers who have the truth. He wants lovers. So even, even the greatest saints, especially the greatest saints, are in dark nights of the soul. They don't see God. They work by pure faith. In a sense, you have less certainty, not more as you progress in the love of God, because he tests you more. Do you really love me? Lovers do not propose in syllogisms. Romeo didn't carry a battery of lawyers with him to, to, to Juliet to convince her that she had to marry him. So that's my psychological answer. I think he gives enough light so that those who truly love him will find him, but not so much light that those who don't want him will find him. I'm not a quantum physicist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, what would you say to the um, person who takes the particular view of quantum physics, um, namely the idea of the wave particle experiment in Schrodinger's cat? I'm not sure if you're familiar with Heisenberg's that. uncertainty principle? Yes, and, and say that on the basis of that, at the heart of the universe, we do not find causality, which of course is the basis of reasoning, which is what we're doing. Well, I'd first say that the causal argument doesn't talk about the microscopic world at all. It talks about the macroscopic world. Secondly, 
I'm not a physicist, so I...